Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Film Seizure. I'm Jason Oliver, and I will be your co-host of three, along with my esteemed colleagues, Mr. Jeff Arbuckle. Jeff, say hello. Hello. And uh, by the way, when you say host of three, it's like, oh, are we going to be like, are, are we charmed now? Are, are, we, are we a coven? <laughs> sure, sure. Cool. <laughs> I'm going to do some spells. Sweet. Do a spell and, to uh, get me to introduce myself. Oh, here, there's that guy. That's, uh, that's, the, that's the other guy in the coven. Interrupt us, introduce you. There you go. Yes. <laughs> What's your name? My name's Chuck Moore. What? Yeah. Amazing. So what are we, what are we doing today? <clears throat> well, this is week three of Coen Brothers Month, a month in which we are exploring the first four films of the Coen Brothers uh, collection. Their um, au revoir, is that the right word? Um, I pronounced a, a French word, I think, correctly. Uh, um, maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, probably. <laughs> Joy de Viver. I was like, hey, that's where I get it. My Irish upbringing. We pronounce things poorly. <laughs> Joy de Viver. Um, but Chuck, uh, that's today's what I was gonna, episode... I was going to ask real quick. Chuck, what, what is, what, where is your family from? Oh, God. Um, all over the place. German descent, Irish descent. Um, that's probably the predominant German and Irish. Okay. And Scottish, Condon. actually. Lots of Little Scottish. Condon, I think. Probably. Yeah. Some. So you can tell with my red beard where I'm from. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I, a pirate. Um, did you say Wakandan? I did, yeah. Little Wakandan. <laughs> <Yeah>. Little Wakandan. <laughs> little little Avarian, little, uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> little viltramite yeah i don't know what the hell's going on um, here, gentlemen <laughs> <laughs> i mean either what the hell are we talking about this week we're talking about the coen brothers third film from uh shit what what was the year on this one 1990 90 uh miller's crossing yes this is their uh the coen's foray into the gangster film um not the first foray into crime that was uh well that's really the, it's the third film that they just that they kind of explore the the theme of crime they do that a lot um but uh this is the first one to set itself in a in a period right so uh this is where we really start to get a lot of the cohen's play with postmodernism with pastiche um we'll see that in spades next week with barton fink um but here they're starting to kind of play around with the period film, um, the gangster film in general. Uh, it is the Irish versus the Italians in the Prohibition era. It's, um, it's very much on the surface kind of your, your traditional gangster film, but um, there's a lot more going on underneath that we'll get into. So, Where does this, uh, um, does this take place in Chicago or New York? You know, I don't think it's ever outright um said where huh. yeah i think it's question. filmed in new orleans but never mentioned where it takes place really yeah okay no i was kind of curious because it, it uh, i mean most of the time when you think of prohibition Just 1920s america <laughs> yeah when you think of 1920s prohibition era you think chicago of course we talked about sure. that earlier in the year um most certainly but yeah i mean but it was everywhere <laughs> you know Oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. Um, the the Coens they they typically like to kind of place their movies in. Well, I guess that's not always true because they um, they definitely do their New York movie with um, Hudsucker Proxy. I believe that's in New York. Anyway, yeah, I don't know. I don't think there there is a really overt uh, place. There's just a very specific time, right? Yeah. Okay. In this movie. So I think I, I've, I've said at length, that this is the, this is the Coen brothers movie that I saw first. I saw this as a kid um, around the time it came out um, when it was, cause it didn't do very well in the theaters. Um, it didn't do very well uh, at the box office. Uh, the got critics buried, did. got yeah, buried by Goodfellas. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> because the, the movie going public only has appetite for one type of movie at a time, apparently. Um, but yeah, Goodfellas definitely um, sucked up all the oxygen 
um, for a lot of films, but definitely a gangster film that year. It's hard to go head to head with Scorsese, right? Yep. Um, but uh, but it found quite a quite a nice life on television. Um, it was probably cheap to pick up uh, to show on on cable, and that's where I saw it. And um, and and amazingly, it's it's a very violent movie, and not a lot of the violence from my from my recollection of my youth was cut out. Um, but uh, but but I but I'm not always really sure of what I remember and what I imagine and what I saw went right because I've seen this movie several times and I typically revisit it every I don't know maybe three or four years I, I watch it sit down and watch it um, and mostly it's because I'm in really in the mood for the Carter Burwell score and the the dialogue the the um the really kind of formal sort of lingo dialogue that the Coens are picking from so many old noir films and kind of mishmashing together in this. It's just a really fun movie to listen to. Um, so when I'm feeling like that, I pop in Miller's Crossing. Anyway, um, Chuck, what about you? Um, what's your, uh, your history and connection with Miller's Crossing? So I may be making this up, but I believe that you and I, the first time I saw this, you were like, wait, you haven't seen Miller's Crossing yet? Because I was a huge Coen Brothers fan. But this Like one I did with Barton of... Fink, apparently, too. <laughs> yeah. That, I think both of the... the one guy that Jason doesn't want to be, apparently. He was. Yeah, I know. Apparently, I'm that guy all the time when it comes to the Coen Brothers. Yeah. I might honestly be mixing those two up. I think it was definitely with Barton Fink for sure, but I feel like I watched this with you for the first time as well. Either way, um, yeah, it's just one of those movies, man. You can just throw it on whenever. And I have that experience with like a lot of Coen Brothers films where they can just be on um, because they always sound good. You know, there's always some interesting dialogue. You don't even ha I mean, you need to pay attention to their films, but they're also films that you can just watch you know yeah if that yeah. makes sense but yeah it um i've always loved it since the first time i saw it um the carter burwell score is one of my favorites mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. all the coen brothers it, it's my favorite burwell score and it, it's one of my favorite scores of all time yeah, yeah it's, it's, in, it's in my top 10 easy i love it awesome yeah so that's me on this one what about you jeffrey uh, this was first time, but I do definitely remember when it was coming out, um, either seeing trailers for it or commercials or uh, you know, maybe just seeing like the reviews of it, um, whatever it was, it was, I feel like it was exceptionally well liked by critics. Uh, or mostly well it was by critics yeah um, for was. ebert ebert didn't like it i don't think um mm, fuck that guy <laughs> yeah fuck that guy <laughs> hey watch out now. <laughs> um i will say that watching it um at least for the first two acts I really, really liked it. I'm a little i've got a little bit of a complicated relationship with this movie the more i think about it um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I didn't like it. I do like it um, quite a bit. It's very, very well shot. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. There is a, um, <clears throat> what do they call that when they, when they talk about like the color palette of a movie? Um, it, it is very, very much what I think of as an early 90s movie. And I was kind of mm -hmm. thinking about that this morning because this week and next week we're going to be, you know, squarely in the early nineties. And I have a little bit more, uh, uh, nostalgia for nineties movies and the way they look and the way that they were kind of made than I do even the eighties movies that a lot of other, like, it seems like the whole world's in love with the eighties. Wasn't that great. Everybody, there were some good things, <laughs> the nineties movies, and it maybe had a lot to do with the nineties was when I was a teenager and older. And, you know, it's like, that was probably easier for me to kind of get into stuff like this. So, yeah. So like, I, I kind of got like all of these kind of disparate feelings, mostly positive, a few negatives, or I think could be perceived as negatives, although they're probably a little bit more, Eh, I'm okay with that, but I, you know, don't love that aspect or something, but 
on yeah. the topic on the topic of like the love of the 90s look i'm wondering about that a little bit i feel like the 90s were the rise of the independent film yeah it was, it was the, the rise return, of, it was the, of, the new the second round of new hollywood yeah right it was, yeah which the coens were very much a part of it yeah. was um it was i think you know this era of 35 millimeter film that obviously we'll never see again it yeah, was, I, I do the, think it's the like the haziness and the graininess of the movies mm -hmm. that make me think of that. And like, like I can tell you just from a random frame of a sunset, it's like that's a '90s movie, or that's an, you know, or and that's I think not it's, from. I the think 90s. it's the only. I think it's the only era of, era of film where you could shoot on thirty five millimeter and it could elevate the look of your picture. Right, it could it could mm -hmm. it could almost make it look more expensive. Like your production mm -hmm. was bigger than it was. It it it's something about I think maybe some of these um, these indie filmmakers and their experimentation with light and and doing different things. It it, it is distinct. It is it's got its own kind of feel for sure. Um, and yeah, we, we just we just don't see films shot like this anymore. Um, other than maybe like the odd um, Christopher Doyle picture or Roger Deakins picture, right? Um, the oh yeah, uh, 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 Skyfall looks like it was a Pierce Brosnan movie with uh, with Daniel Craig superimposed into it. Yeah, because you know, yeah. that's a, that's a Roger Deakins movie. So yeah. Anyway, um, and we'll to get into Deakins next week um, for Barton Fink, but yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not surprised, Jeff, that you didn't completely love this movie because every time I see it now, I kind of like, I do get bogged down a little bit in the third act. Um, but again, it's just, I just love listening to it. I love, I love the, the performances of this movie. I love the, 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 the score cues. I love the, 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 the lingo of this movie. Yeah, that's, um, uh, the, the just, script is, is whip smart. That's for sure. Yeah, it is. It is one of the tightest damn scripts, probably the tightest gangster script, you know, since the heyday of the noir gangster film. Yeah. Okay. What's the rumpus with this movie? What's anyway? the rumpus? I'm gonna give you two the high hat. <laughs> Are you leaving? <laughs> <laughs> um. See, that's interesting. That's that's not how I take the high hat to mean. Um. But, well, leaving uh, or passing or or not. I think I think the high hat is more like your um, your uh, uh, being elitist. You're taking like you're the one who is who is um, uh, being superior in your ways, right? I don't know You're about you, Chuck, but I'll, I'll, I'll give that to Jason. What do you think, Chuck? <laughs> <laughs> right, I was trying to be self-deprecating. Damn it. All right. But then I ended up giving you the high hat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah, the Wikipedia page says a U.S. city. That's funny. Yep. All right. Um, so let's get into it. Well, who are our principal characters? Who wants to, to handle that? Well, we have Gabriel Byrne, who plays Tom Reagan. Um, he is, I don't know if you want to call him the right-hand man, but kind of the brains of Liam, Leo O'Bannon's gang. Mm -hmm. um, and he is basically right off the jump, um, talking kind of like a Godfather-esque beginning for this one, um, with Johnny Casper, um, played by John Polito. He is so awesome in this movie. Johnny oh, Casper. The, the, so we have the these difference two. between Polito in this movie and next week's movie couldn't be more different. In, in couldn't. Couldn't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Polito's great. I, I want to make a quick mention on Polito. Um, I have a theory about his performance as Johnny Casper. Um, actually, I have a, a theory about um tom reagan a little bit gabriel burns performance as tom reagan that both of these sort of um, mirror the relationship between the two characters um the boss and daniel mcginty in preston sturge's the great mcginty because you've got this kind of like mustachio pencil mustachio short um fat gangster in the boss who is um who's smart 
but also recognizes smarts when he sees it in respect and respects that and, and is willing to tolerate a little bit of lip <laughs> from, from the, the guy who knows he's smart and, and isn't going to back down to anyone who is the, the, the McGinty character. That movie is fascinating. Like I, 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 rec- I, re- I recommend you to go back and watch it. It's very breezy, very fun, about 80-minute watch. It's on the Criterion channel. And, and watch it through the lens of Miller, Miller's Crossing, and I think you'll be, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Anyway, sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, Johnny Casper is the, the rival gangster leader um basically we have leo is in cahoots with the mayor and the police department and he offers protection to many of chicago or i say chicago because it feels chicago doesn't it it? it does kind of feel chicago (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) yeah um many of the city's criminal elements so we have johnny casper or casper is there complaining about Bernie Burnbaum, played by John Turturro. But you don't um, know that for a while. That's what I, one of the things I really love about this movie is they, they everybody talks about Bernie for a while throughout the first he shows up until yeah. you finally meet him. Yeah, and when you meet yeah. him, it's it's one of my favorite shots in the movie. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so what Bernie is doing is he's he's taking information about rigged fights or rigged horse races um, and selling that information to other people so the odds are changing on casper's rigged fights so as he puts it you know the money's riding on somebody else's pocket instead of his so he wants leo to allow him to kill bernie um but bernie falls under leo's protection to start he's not he's not satisfied with the honest dollar he makes on the vig (laughs) as as casper puts it (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and then we, we have the Dane in the room, so they ask him, so you want to kill him? He says, for starters. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so Eddie Dane is basically the the Tom Reagan to Johnny Casper. Um, I don't know that he's as smart or as bright. He's more of brawn or, I don't know, deceit for Casper. He's not legitimately um, Tom's mental rival i don't think but they are rivals in this film sure yeah he thinks he is he thinks he's he's as smart as tom right and he almost he almost beats him a couple times he sure does yeah he sure does Um, he would have he would have um if yeah and by with no real help from tom himself like tom just kind of gets lucky a couple times yeah yes he does irish luck for sure (laughs) um but yeah, that's the basic premise of this. Of course, it's a convoluted a little because we have um, Verna, who is Casper, or not Casper, excuse me, Leo's um, beau, or I don't know what you'd call her, just his his lady. Uh, yeah, um, he's, a he's a suitor. Yeah, yeah, he's <laughs> right. a suitor. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a little bit of like a mistress. It's a little bit of a just a. Yeah, it's his, it's his, uh, it's his dame or whatever. Yeah, Yeah, his dame, his lady. But as it's revealed later, she is Bernie's sister. Mm -hmm. So that's what really gives Leo the inclination to protect Bernie. And that's, and, 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 yeah, and Tom sees through that and because Tom is also sleeping with Verna. (laughs) Yes. So he knows Verna for what she is, um, but he's having trouble convincing tom of that or sorry he's having trouble convincing leo of that um because he doesn't necessarily want to reveal um how he knows that verna is um a tramp essentially yes but he also he he is urging leo to you know to allow casper to kill bernie even though he's also sleeping with verna it's a weird kind of complicated web um that they are all in to start this movie well, it, it's interesting because, you know, I think you have your, your, your Gabriel Byrne, you know, Tom is, is the anti-hero of this movie, right? He's not a good guy, but he has, he, he does have scruples and he has a lot of loyalty to Leo, um, even though he's sleeping with his lady. Um, so he is a complicated character for sure. Um, but he's... Um, he has his own sort of, this movie is a lot about ethics, right? That's the whole, 
the whole start of this movie is a diatribe by Casper about ethics and what that means and how ethics is subjective, right? And everybody has their own sort of brand of loyalty of ethics throughout this movie and how they work within that personal, um, that personal sphere, I guess, of what's proper and what's, and what goes against their own personal ethics is what kind of makes the conflict happen. Right. Um, and that's really fun to watch unravel, but it's also fun to watch people operate within that set of rules that doesn't necessarily always overlap. Right. And Casper, it, like you said, he's, the most ethical i put that in air quotes because he believes in this more than anybody else he, mm -hmm. he believes in the friendship aspect he believes in in there being like an order right to to the disorder of gangster life i guess mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting that your primary bad guy is in a position or has beliefs you would normally attribute to a a good dude yeah but it also it, it also um it, it eats away at him more through the movie because the the more he tries to stick to that the the more he becomes dangerous later um because yes. it's it, because it starts it it's uh whereas leo i feel like um well leo leo understands the game and he understands the politics of it too. I mean, he's a political boss. So he understands that there are more gray area than there is white and black. Um, and so yes. he's. Um, Leo also thinks more with his heart, whereas Casper thinks a little bit more within this concept, not necessarily his mind, but with, with this, this rigid structure of, of right and wrong that he, as he sees it. So he's more of like a rules guy, whereas Leo is more of like a, well, I'm uh, I, I do what feels right. Yeah. Yeah. The, it's interesting to me because Casper throughout the film, he, if you picture Casper and in Leo is like sticks, right? Casper has to bend, bend, bend a lot before mm -hmm. he breaks, mm -hmm. right? And Leo, on the other hand, is rigid. He doesn't bend at all until he just breaks, you know, as seen with Tom later in the film. It's interesting that they're, yeah, well, I don't know. Well, I, part of that, part of that, I think, is that Leo is in power, right? Right, right. So he doesn't have to bend. So it's really difficult for Casper to have to bend because to him he is uh he's um contradicting his own ethics by right. allowing this to stand by not being able to take out bernie and there's a callousness to that right because you know leo he's like he doesn't you get the sense that he doesn't want to kill anyone right he um but yes he is definitely under the thumb of verna to a degree but you also get the sense that you know he um he's not a guy who's gotten to where he has gotten without making some tough decisions. Right. But he, um, but he's not going to bow down to Casper's demands because he is in power and he wants to make that known as well. Um, and he is, in, he is absolutely given Casper the high hat, right? Yep. He's treating him like the underling that he is. Yeah. And even so, just to, to clarify my previous statement, even with Tom and Leo, there is no bend. Even though they're on the same side, it's just, you know, he just breaks all of a sudden. Um, yeah, Tom, Tom yeah, is, 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 is complicated, beyond <clears throat> complicated in this, right. in the fact that why he does the things he does. You know, you, you can make a, a lot of hey, out of discussing, you know, where his, what, what type of loyalty he has to Leo, right? Um, because it is, you, when you find out in the end, you know, he, he, he does a lot of what he does to, to reprove his loyalty to Leo. But he, and he even makes the comment at one point, um, we might be through, I can't remember, I have to paraphrase it, but we're through and, um, and, and something else, it's, it's different. I can't remember exactly how it is, too, if you guys can remember. Yeah, he says that to Verna later when she said, I thought you said you're done with him and he said well i am done with him but that doesn't mean i don't care right it's something along basically those lines. basically right. yeah yeah anyway the, um, yeah and this does also i mean there that i think also speaks to 
a, a much more realistic angle. Like, you know, Leo is not gunning for, for Tom in the end. Um, but, you know, so that allows him to operate in the sense of what a realistic situation with people with real understanding that sometimes principles are not the same as your personal values or the way that you govern your transactions. Cause some, like I said, there's a lot more gray area, right? So it's, um, it allows for you to um, still care and still want to help without, um, without really being fully 100% on that side and kind of operating in your own best interest, but also something that will benefit your friend because you do still care. I mean, it's, it's like, um, you know, it, it's like still, uh, still like, you know, if you're, um, if you're, you know, if you dated your buddy's sister or something and you ended up breaking up with her, you still like your, her, her brother, you're still buds with him. You know, so it's like there, it may have changed a little bit of that relationship, but you still care. You don't want him to be hurt. It's that kind of, it's that same kind of morality uh, in this and, and uh, position that, that is taken. And it's, it's kind of interesting because I think that there is a little bit, something a little bit more universal there too, um, because there is a great deal of com- confusion between what your rigid, uh, where you rigidly place your values versus what the reality of things are. And uh, that's a very realistic mm-hmm. issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's uh, people say, well, why, you know, how can you still like that comedian or that actor or that politician or whatever? They did a bad thing. Well, yes. And we don't like that, but you don't, you don't throw them out with the garbage all at the same time too. You, you, you have to navigate that. And that's, that's part of being in a realistic grown up scenario. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. I also think that Tom's loyalty in, in many ways is unquestionable as well, which mm-hmm. is another way to read it because um, you could argue that his relationship with Verna um, that he loves her in his own way because he sees himself in her. They're, 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 I mean, she says it later. We're both a couple of heels, right? Um, and he, he wants, he wants to keep her out of Leo's life because she would be bad for Leo and bad for business. Yeah. 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 She's definitely bad for business because Bernie, being alive, is essentially going to start a war between these two families if you want to call them call them that um so gabriel Byrne does want to end this war before it happens he sees casper as someone who potentially could beat leo in a war um Mm -hmm. so he wants to smooth this thing out it's it's interesting if you talk about it you say gabriel Byrne has a lot of luck Mm -hmm. in this film which he does but i also think a lot of the things he does, even maybe sleeping with Verna while he does love her, is all part of his plan. Sure. Right. Sure. And I think I think the way that um, Tom loves Verna is a different way than Leo loves Verna. Right. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think their concepts of love are different. Uh, I don't even think Tom would call it love. Uh, it, it's just he, but he definitely longs for her in a way he doesn't understand. Yeah. Um, because at the, at the end of the day, Tom is honestly, he's, he's not a, a great guy. <laughs> no, he's, but, but, but he, you um, do see him react to things that, uh, Casper does that yes, is he has objectively wrong. Uh, like he, he smacks, and he, he smacks his son and, and uh-huh. you almost think Tom right then and there is going to react in a way that will blow his right. entire plan up. Um, the thing about think Tom that is he's him. pragmatic. Yeah. The thing about Tom is he's pragmatic, and 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 when you have somebody who's so strictly pragmatic, you you 
there is a moral ambiguity in some of the decisions you have to make. It's a utilitarianism that can be jarring. Lots it's of big the, words in this episode, yeah. gentlemen. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think <laughs> I'm giving you the high hat. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the um, I, I think the the layman term for what Jason just said was uh, means to an end. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. Yeah, sure. So really, like the center, because you're you're questioning whether he at, not questioning it, but whether he does love Verna or not. Really, the central themes of this movie are heart and brain. Right? It's almost like Wizard of Oz kind of shit. But it, in almost every scene, either Tom's thinking or his heart are mentioned. Like someone is always talking about how smart he is or whether he does or does not have a heart, you know, like the look into your heart line, which we'll come mm-hmm. to later. Mm-hmm. So really the, the, the other thing, yeah, the other theme of this movie is just heart, Tom's heart, whether, whether he's doing things out of love and care or he's doing things because of his morality or what have you. There's also a running theme with the hat. Yes. Tom's, Tom's hat and other people's hats that I think is significant. And I don't know if now's the time or we, if we want to maybe save some of that for the end. Um, but, we, but I want to make sure we put a, a bookmark on, on that symbolism. The, the, the hat is ultra important. So, yes. yes, we should talk about it probably maybe when Leo and Tom have their first altercation is a good time to bring the hat up. Probably. Okay. Would you or say that the, uh, would you say that the that the hat is highly important? Is it a highly <laughs> yes, important I would. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. okay. So where are we at? Um, Casper Bernie, calls them all a bunch of fancy pants and leaves the office. Go ahead. <laughs> and Leo tells them to take his flunky and dangle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't think anybody other than Albert Finney could say that line fucking great man yeah it's <laughs> so great um yeah he was not the first choice weirdly for the cohen's for this um it was uh i think it was the guy who played nathan arizona in arizona raising arizona was, was oh, the yeah. first choice but he but he passed away so then they got albert finney who could not be more perfect um i could be wrong on that but um that's just coming from dark recesses of my brain somewhere. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, Albert Finney could not be more perfect. Uh, he plays the Irish gangster very well. It's almost like too well. <laughs> it's got just the perfect look as well. Um, I mean, Irish, I guess, is that look. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> um but yeah, what happens next after uh, Casper is dispatched? Um, Leo and uh, Tom have it out. Tom doesn't like the decision, and um, but Leo's like it's going to be what it's going to be. And um, they uh, uh, he also there's a, there's a running thread throughout the movie of Tom is a bad gambler and he is in deep to a bookie called Lazar, and uh, Leo offers to settle his debt with. Lazar, um, Tom doesn't want that. And that's an interesting thing, I think, in a dynamic in their relationship. And it tells you a lot about Tom. Tom doesn't want Leo to pay his debts. You get the sense that Tom doesn't want to be indebted to, to someone else. He wants to get out of debt altogether, right? Even though him and Leo are friends, um, he's afraid, I think, that um, he doesn't want to be the guy who has this benevolent protector, I guess, in Leo. He's, he very much is his own man and he wants to stay that way. So he's right. going he's gonna to settle his own debt on his own because that's why God created cards and he loses more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he also loses, maybe this is the time to bring up the hat because yeah. Verna wins his hat in a game win game. We don't see this happen. It's all the, the bartender at Leo's club. Um, basically explains and they have an interesting relationship too and it's hard to really explain their relationship but it seems like a good one the bartender cares for tom and tom Mm kind of has a a kinship or friendship with him i think the way to do this with the hat is to just mention it overtly throughout as we kind of talk about the the movie and then we'll wrap it up at the end sure yeah so tom 
Tom wakes up without his hat. He's got a major headache. He apparently got real drunk and lost a lot of money. <laughs> um, so he goes to, to Verna's apartment um, to try to get his hat back. And she I is want very, me hat. I want me hat. <laughs> <laughs> and is that uh, is that what you came here for? And he's basically like, "Yeah, I want my hat. want me hat." She closes the door on him. He knocks again and says, "I could use a drink." And it's almost too predictable, which is kind of weird for a Coen <laughs> Brothers film to know what the next line is going to be. Yeah, she's like, "Well, why didn't you just say that?" <laughs> but this is—I don't know. Did you get the impression that their relationship starts here, no. or that it was ongoing sexually at least before this moment? I think it was ongoing, but you could read it either way. Because I, I think that's important an important distinction and maybe we don't have to make it as to whether him sleeping with Verna was part of his plan that is enacted throughout the whole movie. If he'd already been in bed with her before the Leo um, or excuse me, Bernie situation is brought to a head in the beginning of the movie, then that kind of takes his intentions out at least. in Yeah, that is interesting, right? It is interesting about, you know, what does it say about his loyalty at that point? If he hadn't slept with her before, then his loyalty is pretty much sterling, right? Um, and if he sleeps with her the, for the first time, then it is part of his plot to ultimately protect Leo from himself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's the way I choose to believe that. It that just seems so little... familiar, though, that I guess that I just yeah. assume that, that they've had this relationship. Yeah. Yeah. At the absolute yeah, and they have very a weird... least, they, they have known each other for a long time, just probably through the club. Um, yeah. But then also, maybe they've kind of, maybe they never really had a real relationship, but they kind of flirted. It, it's possible that she was only kind of latching on to whatever she think was the most protective person, probably knowing that her, her brother oh, was well, a little bit of a shit bag. Is. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah yeah most definitely well as leo describes verna later she's a grifter so is her yeah. brother they're both yeah. bad people yeah. um so yeah but it, it, at this point obviously they do they do get together um and then i believe the next scene uh tom is sitting in his apartment or how it's a, an apartment in barton arms interestingly enough maybe a shout out to barton fink um mm-hmm. yeah <clears throat> well, uh, I, believe the, like I believe the writing. Or... I believe the writing of the two movies kind of crisscrossed each other, uh, from it what did. I understand. Yeah, they took a break during the writing of this, during the writing of Miller's Crossing, and wrote Barton Fink. Yeah, yeah. in like three weeks or and something. That, and like that. that's important to our discussion about Barton Fink next week. So, so we'll table that. Yeah, sure. Yep. Uh, um, what was happening here? So Leo shows up at Tom's apartment. Um, he offers him a drink and they, they have kind of a funny discussion about how Tom stuff is way better than the shit they sell at the, uh, <laughs> at the club. Um, yeah. But, the motor oil or battery acid or whatever he calls it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Leo is out looking for Verna. And this is when we learn really that Verna and, and Leo are an item. This um, is also, I think a, a movie gaffe because he shows up at Verna's apartment. How do they end up at his apartment? Stephanie asked me the same thing. She was like, well, why would Leo go to Verna's apartment, find Tom and not think that was weird? I'm like, no, they're at Tom's apartment. Yeah. But I think they just go there is my thought. Well, this, but, this who could knows? Play it, to... it doesn't also have to be the same night either. either. Right. right. It does it, not have it, to be. It, yeah. Right. And it could also play to the fact that they already had something going on that way as well. It feels to me a little bit like the the Coens talk a lot about how they, um, the way they write a script is they, they put people into situations and they put themselves as writers into situations that they then have to write themselves out of. It's like, that's their creative process. And that's how they kind of come up with these crazy plots that they, that they write. Um, And sometimes I think that uh, they do sort of hit, a corner that they're not quite sure how to paint out of and, and, and they do it in editing. <laughs> Fair. And I think that might be one of those, those instances. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At this point, I definitely wouldn't be surprised if it was a few days later and they've yeah. been going at it quite a few times um, because 
Tom or Leo mentions that he has Verna followed, um, probably because she's been unfindable a few times. So I'm guessing this is week, or, week or two or later. It, it, it could it could bear out that Leo is not as good of a guy as we think he is. That he's a little jealous. That he's oh he's certainly jealous. I mean that's yeah, the reason he's having her on. followed, mm-hmm. right? That, that he doesn't he's, he's want pulling her. A, he's pulling a Dan Hedaya. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wait. Just to be clear here, I don't think Leo is a good guy. No. Well, so when you say as good he, as we well, think he is, he, I don't think he is at all. Well, he is presented with. He would be the guy you would rather talk to than Casper. Casper seems like at any it's, second he will kill everybody or or fuck up to the point where everybody dies <laughs> it, look well, Ca- casper casper operates within like an ethical relativism and leo is more a um a uh, uh moral relativism right so it's it's that that difference between what rules are <laughs> yeah and i honestly even in the beginning i think i said this casper to me seems like the better guy i don't know that he is it's just the take i have on him that the, if their roles were flipped and and casper was a good guy if you want to call any of them good guys because they're just good fellows right it's right. all um, about the pov right yeah, yeah. right yeah. and i think and i think so, we're in the P- I, and i think that's where i'm kind of coming from is that our pov is tom's pov right so we are we are seeing Leo as a buddy more than yeah. a threat. And, and and it's honestly kind of like this refreshing friendship between them that you don't always see in a gangster film. Like you, you get that you get the impression that they are comfortable with one another, they're easygoing with one another, they trust one another, and there's a loyalty to each other. And that's not something you get in a lot of gangster movies. Look, so um, I'm- I'm weird. I the way I perceive their relationship is kind of like Johnny Dangerously. Um, <laughs> like Tom, Tom was like a little paper boy when when, uh, yeah. when Leo was first starting out, and he kind of took him under his wing. So he's almost like his son, but he's also his friend. Totally. Um, that they'd been together for thirty years, and Tom was very young when he met him. That's Absolutely. I see it. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I agree with that read com- completely. Yeah. Yep. It'd be funny um, if this movie was as funny as Johnny Dangerously. <laughs> <laughs> it has moments. Yes, uh, it does. <laughs> um, but anyway, okay, so uh, they have their discussion in Tom's apartment. Um, it's it's pretty brash on the part of Tom to when knowing that Verna is in the next room, which is uh, it's got to be pretty um, uh, nerve wracking. But Tom doesn't play it that way at all he's very no, cool, well I, collected uh, yeah i get the impression i mean this is kind of just the um um i i kind of feel like this is just like hey you know he's used to being in these kind of situations where he's got to talk a certain way to keep the attention off of the thing he doesn't want the person to see or to be right. a part you know whatever he's but you see uh, um and it's not actually even clear that she's in the other room because, again, it's kind of like, well, whose apartment are they in? It's There is kind of a confusion. So it does kind of work to to see that Verna is in his bed after um, uh, Leo leaves because it's, it, it sort of punctuates the tension of the scene, I guess. Um, it can be, again, kind of viewed a couple different ways as it unfolds but but the important piece of information that is revealed is that um leo has put a tail on verna a guy named rug and he's disappeared yep and that gets tom's head spinning because like what happened to rug and you see what happened to rug i believe in the, the very next scene which was one of the most beautifully shot and edited scenes in the movie and in all of the Coen's films in my opinion with the little boy and the dog the discovering the boy. dead body the slack jawed little boy discovering this big fat man's dead body in the alley with his with his dog at, by his side in a way it's like the dog is is part of the the framing is part of the it's like a trio of characters and the dog is one of them and it's treated equally i love it so so much and they all are kind of interpreting what's they're both are kind of interpreting interpreting what they're seeing but what's great about this is the little boy he like is is fixated on the man's hair 
and he's like kind of pulling at it and he realizes it's a toupee and he pulls it off. It's a rug. It's a rug. And it's a rug. And then you understand why his name is rug, which is hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) And it's this beautiful joke, right? Just right in the middle of daytime ugliness of you know this victim of a gang war uh but it, but this this death becomes really important because it kicks off it really is the thing that starts the war between it's the powder uh, keg incident yeah it's yeah. really the thing that starts the war between casper and tom and it's kind of the point of no return uh and it's amazing later we'll talk about why rug actually was killed it is such a cohen thing um but uh, but for now we don't know, and there's co- there's a couple different suspects. But the one that you kind of think it might be is, and they want you to believe is that it was Verna because he was shot with a 22 pistol, a woman's gun, a pop gun, and Verna would have motive to kill Rug if she discovered he was following her and she was sleeping around on Leo, which would endanger Bernie. Yep. And it's important to mention here, I think, for the hat conversation, even though this isn't a hat, this is somebody's headpiece getting removed, right? Yeah. Um, Yeah. That's a good point. I just wanted to throw that out there. Yes. Good note. Um, So then the next scene, I don't quite remember. This movie is so dense. Um, well, it's, it's, it's right it's, here, close to here, where, where. Go ahead, Jeff. You, no, you is, is this? Like it was sure. this when? Uh, was this when Casper calls Tom? To uh, yeah, in, thereabouts anyway. Yeah, he's like, yep. hey, I just wrote you a check. Uh, I just wrote a check for your bookie for fifteen hundred dollars. That's more than what you own, but I feel like you're gonna make more bets. <laughs> so this so he's kinda giving him both where credit. That Chuck mentioned that Casper hits his his kid. He's like um No hot dog that's with later. mustard. That's Isn't that later? later? That's later. That's hot dog, hot dog later. with mustard. That was right before he brings No, 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 no. That's that's those are two different scenes. Oh, but yeah, you're right. He slaps because him later. He, he slaps, slaps him later. later. Yeah. In this scene, he tells everybody, um, hey, my kid is smart as a whip. And he tries to give him the penny for the hot dog with mustard. Yeah, that happens right before he leaves. Wrong, yeah, he, he keeps picking the wrong hand, so the kid's dumb as fuck. Um, yeah, he's, but yeah, it, 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 and and Casper's kind of exasperated by his dumbness too. Right. It's it's really funny, right? Uh, like, and his wife is just is just yelling at him in Italian because the doctor has told her that he's too fat. And <laughs> right. yeah, so what'd you eat for lunch today? <laughs> right. Hot dog hot with dog. mustard. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so uh, at this point, um, yeah, because it's much, much later that he slaps the kid because that's when yeah, he's you're right, got you're right. the power and he can't, he can't pull the same moral strings. Right. That, and he's starting to unravel right. in his loyalties. Yeah. Right. It's, it's, it's tough running things. Yeah. It, right. Well, the, the, the <laughs> crown or the hat is heaviest. Is that. heavy. Yeah. Yes. Indeed. So uh, the, yeah. So he is, uh, so he says, hey, hey, I'm going to give you, I'm going to pay off your debt and I'm going to make it for a little bit more so you can make more bets. And this is what I need from you. Basically, yeah. it's like, I need you to kill uh, Bernie Bimbom. Yeah, I need you to give up Bernie, basically. Basically, yeah. and he won't really do it. So, all right, well, the other, the other side of this is we're going we're gonna to work you over. Um, and so yeah. Mike Starr comes. This is over. this is great, Mike Starr. Yeah, <laughs> this is one of my favorite moments in the movie. <laughs> this is probably uh, my favorite scene because this is very Coen Brothers. He's off in the distance, uh-huh. and he starts rushing towards him. And, and he takes his he very 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 quietly takes his hat off, takes his jacket, jacket off, off and puts and hangs rolls up, up his sleeves yep. too. I think, and yep. then so he starts running towards Tom, and Tom's like, "Whoa, wait, wait." And so, like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And he takes off his jacket, and then he picks up a chair, <laughs> <laughs> and he hits him. He hits, hits him, him right in the, in the ventilator, right in the nose. <laughs> to which Mike Starr goes, "Ow, Tom!" <laughs> and he Jesus, just Tom. Off. Tom. Yeah, yep. and he just Tom. walks off. <laughs> Jesus, Tom. <laughs> and then he goes and gets the Dane, who is he, well. He know he doesn't. He get he gets tic tac, doesn't he? Yeah, the he gets little a, guy. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, but and the, who who comes in charging? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the big guy's got to go get the little guy. <laughs> right. They, well, they and the big guy is almost the like the the big guy is almost like crying over being you know it's like being hit yeah. by the chair. <laughs> Well, it well, speaks he, to well, kind well, of like well, it's a break in. It's a break in ethics, right? It's it. He would expect this to be a stand up fight. And Tom, the pragmatist, goes for the chair. He's going yeah, for the I'm blow, the sucker punch. Him. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's it. It's like it's like Tom <laughs> used the guerrilla tactics of the Revolutionary War on right. <laughs> yeah. instead of just charging up, lining up, know, walking yep, down lining the up and, and walking yep. towards you. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but so, they're starting to kick his ass. <laughs> Go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> no, and then and then the place gets raided, and this is not the this yep, is not yeah. the last time this place gets raided. <laughs> <laughs> and so Tom gets knocked out, and when he comes to the place has been raided, and now the cops are working over Tic Tac, <laughs> and it's like, hey, you want in on the? Do you want to? You want to? Uh, uh, what do you say? You want to? Um, well, scrape your knuckles on this, or was there something? Yeah, like that? something like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God, there's so much. Like it's so fast. All the dialogue. It's just, it's like a, it's like a song almost. Well, then it's just comes, got a cadence and a rhythm a to it. The whole it's thing. Yeah. 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 There you go. <laughs> yeah. And he comes outside and he talks to like one of the 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 cops uh, in charge. And while they're talking, a gunfight breaks out. And they're like, "Oh yeah. Jesus!" You know, it's like, <laughs> but they're yeah. just still standing there out in the open, uh, and he gets a little bit of information. So, yeah, and the chief, the chief, is, yeah, he gets him, tells him some information about Rogue, tells him about the twenty-two. That's when Tom starts to think Verna. Um, he tells him that you know he's just the chief, but this is a mess. This whole thing's a mess. Can't you talk to Leo about this mess? And um, because Leo has ordered this this raid because that because Rug got killed. Um, so this whole uh, the, but then Tom lays into the chief, puts him in his place. And he's like, "It's not up to you to decide what Leo does. Leo's going to do what he's going to do, and you're going to you're going to dangle basically." There's um, a bunch of other cops that could be chief. Yeah, yeah, around right here, basically, like you're just here like, because we let you be. But he's just like, it's a mess, though. It's just a, a goddamn mess. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So so yeah, Tom Tom gets some info and then he goes to see Verna, I believe. Yeah. And Verna isn't happy to see him, um, because. Uh, well, he goes to. The, uh, have, we, have we skipped the bathroom scene yet? That's what I was trying. Oh to do. yeah. Like, when does he go to the bathroom? Sorry, I for, I totally forgot about that. And he scene. just busts in on all the women. He's like, "All right, co- you know, get out or cover and it all up." All the women. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they have it out. They have it out at at Leo's bar because because basically Tom tells her to to stop fucking around with Leo, and she's yeah. not having it. Or and, I'm gonna tell him. Yeah. yeah. Or I'm gonna tell him about us, and then she's she's like, well, that's that'll be bad for you, and she knows that he he has no love for Bernie and isn't really willing to protect Bernie. So she's she has so so they have it out pretty good. You're right. And then he goes to see her after he finds out it was a 22 because he's going to essentially accuse her of killing rug. Um, she calls the cops, but he gets on the, I love this scene. He gets on the phone. He's like, who's this? And it's somebody, some Irish cop that he knows at the, down at the precinct. He's like, um, Oh yeah. It's just false alarm. No, no worries. Um, while I have you, can you put on so-and-so he puts on so-and-so tell so-and-so I need you to put some, some guys on Leo's house. Cause he's afraid of retaliation at this point. Right. Right and yep. and then that and they have happens. a little <laughs> yep and it's 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 great <laughs> it's, it's great it yeah, is I'm, so violent I love the initial like you you have Leo sitting in his bed and there's obviously a guard maybe one guard on his house um, that gets killed um, and Leo sees smoke coming through the floor and he's like well that's odd um, puts on his slippers sits there for a little bit longer, like truly trying to assess if someone's coming. And basically there's two dudes with Tommy guns or Thompson's as they're called, um, who break through the door. And as they do, Leo grabs his gun, rolls under the bed, shoots one of them in the foot. 
he falls down, then he puts one in the brain, right? You always got to put one in the brain, um, as we find out later. Um, and then he gets up, grabs his Tommy gun, and chases the other guy. <laughs> and he kind of does a, a loop-de-loop thing. We see this a couple times where he escapes out a window and go, drops um, off his oh roof. Oh, my God. When he, jump, when he jumps out the window, drops off the roof, it's the most hilarious like stunt stand-in ever for <laughs> Albert Finney. It kills me every time. I was like, there ain't no fucking way Albert Finney's that limber. Right. It just makes me laugh. It makes me laugh. <laughs> He also, he also, yeah, when he's out on the yard after he jumps out the window, he shoots up at the gangster who is about to shoot down at him. And, and he, he gets shoots him, him about, and then, yeah, he shoots him about with about 300 bullets. It's like, he, yes. oh my God, and then, he's already and then the dead. guy also, <laughs> then the guy also like is shooting the gun because he can't control his own like, um, uh, like convulsions, right? From well, getting shot. So all these bullets yeah. are like coming from the window, from down below, and on himself with the Tommy shoots gun. Himself he shoots himself in the feet. Himself in the feet. Mm, yeah. yeah. There are more bullet hits in that, more squib hits in that than I think in the scene in RoboCop that got it the X rating. Like I don't know <laughs> how that got past the MPAA as an R rating. I maybe because maybe because the the blood is a little dry. It's not like like not really splattery, but man. It's like one gaping hole appeal. It feels like at the end of that scene. Yeah, it would have ripped him in half. It like. <laughs> <laughs> the um, other thing I want to mention about the scene is it's all scored to um, Danny, a, boy. Uh, Danny Boy. Um, was this when you said, I feel like this is Irish exploitation? No, that Jeff? was immediately. Uh, that was oh. the end of the credits. <laughs> well, well, this is, this is <laughs> when it hits the apex of that. Right. Um, <laughs> it, it, is, it is when I think of the song Danny Boy, this is the definitive version that I think of sung by Frank Patterson, a pretty well-known uh, Irish tenor of his time. And I, I, whenever I hear Danny Boy, I wish it was this version because this is my favorite version. It's interesting to me that they, instead of using an existing version of Danny Boy, they recorded this for the film. Yeah. There would have been versions of that song on record that are from this time period. So it's interesting that they didn't, they didn't go that route. I, I would yeah, have, man, you're right, I don't know it's why. excellent. Yeah, I, but, I would man, have it's, just uh, I would have just used the the leather guy from Can't Stop the Music singing Oh Damn. <laughs> but it, I don't know. I that mean, that's, that's a villain. That's they the must, there must have been something. There must have been something they specifically wanted, you know, from probably you know selecting Frank Patterson particularly for this. I mean, and, and they got it. I mean, it, it truly is, in my opinion, the definitive version. <laughs> it's excellent. Boy. It's awesome. <laughs> um, I'm glad they made that decision. It's Me too. kind of perplexing. <laughs> um, but yeah, even though he had shot 300 bullets, which that seems a little bit excessive. I don't know if you guys agree with me. I think the Coens are very <laughs> proud of that scene. Yes. I've it is read, a bit excessive. To me, it's like, it does go on way too long. Um, but, but even though he shot 300 bullets, he still has 300 more. Yeah. For... And he chases them down the street in the car. Yeah. <laughs> Blows up the car. It looks so cool the way he's going down the street with the Tommy gun in his pajamas. Like, oh, and the way it's lit. Like, oh, God. Oh, that's, I, feel I really, mean, I really hit hit his stride with this movie yeah this yeah. is uh you know this is goodfellas level uh like yeah. shot oh, like uh but yeah. by the way uh you know stay tuned next month we're gonna be talking about that so yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not oh, done yeah. with gangsters right, quite yet that'll be good i like i like that we accidentally kind of created that synergy to use a term i hate synergy i hate that word um but yes uh I, there's a line then uh it comes it comes around you know obviously now the next scene uh tom goes to see leo and, and leo's got his hallway packed with goons i always love that in gangster movies where you've got like like guys in the hallway smoking cigarettes with their guns out and they take the cones take this to the nth degree because there's got to be like a hundred guys in this hallway in fact th this is like a so so such a well-known kind of trope uh, uh that it was also used in ryan johnson's brick when um the kid uh kingpin is is at war and he's got all the guys lined up in his hallway too when um uh what's his name has to go see him anyway it's it's almost identical joseph hey, gordon levitt I, joseph gordon levitt yeah. i would i would be uh, I, it would be I would be gobsmacked if it wasn't a direct reference. 
Uh, it seems like Ryan yes. Johnson probably watches oh, most, the most same certainly. movies that we do. <laughs> most, most certainly, yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, you the, one of my favorite lines in the movie come, happens now, where basically Leo's um, one of his other like head goons, essentially, like his war general, basically. I can't remember the name of the character. Tall Irish dude um, is telling Tom what happened. And, um, and and he's telling him about like the guys and he's like, yeah, the rest of them are full of lead. And Tom asks, who's lead? And he says, Leo's. And Tom kind of looks at him and the guy says, the old man's still an artist with the Thompson. It's awesome. <laughs> I love that line. I <laughs> love it. <laughs> yep. And then there's some great um, description of, of power next because mm -hmm. um, Tom is like, look, this has to stop. Um, and Leo's basically like, well, I'm in power here. I have all the power. And, and Tom says something to the effect of, well, you think you're in power, but once they think you're not running it anymore, you're not. He's like, the only reason people believe that you're in power, or the only reason you're in power is because people believe that you're in power. If they start to believe you're not in power, that's when you're not. I totally butchered that. I'm sorry. No, it's a fine paraphrase, though. Yeah. yeah. So that's the that's the theme here. We have we have Leo saying or Tom saying this is enough. You're going to get beat. And Tom or Leo in his I will not break mode. You know, rigid stick. I've I've got this under control. And and this is and this is where you know Tom is like, okay, the only way we can stop this from really spiraling out of control is to give Casper Bernie. So that's the only play here, right? And, and the only way to convince Leo that Verna is no good at this point is to admit he tries first to, to, to give him all the information he has to, to, to prove that she is sleeping around on him without maybe putting even his name Brooke. in it. And, uh, and, then, and then also planting the, the seed that, you know, yeah, she killed Rug. And he's still not quite buying it. And then he realizes, well, my last card to play is to be is to tell him that I'm the one that's sleeping with Verna, and it does the trick. Uh, it's what it what it's what needed to happen. It's what Leo needed to hear. Um, but it it the balance of power has shifted by now because um, Leo has been um, you know it's kind of been seen that his his top guy has betrayed him in some way. And that's where very much how it's seen. And, um, and you see the balance of power shift to, to Casper. Um, I love, I love how you, you got to know, this is part of Tom's plan too. how, oh, yeah. how, how public this fight becomes 100%. Like he needs everyone to see that Leo is beating the shit out of him. So he's kind of like letting it happen and backing away the whole time. So he can get into the ballroom. Um, and I love the scene when Leo's rolling up his sleeves and he's walking down the stairs at him. It's just so well there's, shot. There's a, there's a really important moment here too, um, where Tom first gets hit by Leo in the hallway. Um, oh, and it's in the hallway of goons, right? And mm -hmm. Tom like falls over, but the goons lift him up and another goon picks up his hat, gives it to him. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. super important um, in the hat symbolism. Yes, 100%. But he does, when, when Tom starts to beat him up, he loses his hat, or Leo beats him up, he loses his hat. A couple times, I think it falls off his head. Um, and then another weird scene, another one where I'm like, I don't know if we needed to see this happen here. And it is Coen brothers -y, but when he falls into the big, large lady's <laughs> lap, basically, and she beats him with his purse. With the purse. It, it, that's... Yeah. I, I, every time I, that scene happens, I, I kind of groan. It's just a bit of a groaner. It's, it's like, like a naked gun thing or so. It, it belongs in a different kind of film. Yeah. It's like that zany moment that, that again, sort of feels like the Coens being the Coens, but it feels a little out of place here to me. <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> but, it, kinda... but, but, but it's the lady in the grocery store in Raising Arizona. You know, it's that same joke. They just love the fat lady screaming joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think it also serves as a little bit of levity. It's like, yeah, maybe we're supposed to realize at this point that this isn't as serious as it looks, because it's not, right? Yeah, that, that's, it's, it's kind of like a subconscious cue. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can buy that. Yeah. yeah. But now Tom is a free agent, right? 
Yeah, he's, he's gotten the kiss off. That's uh, you know the phrase this is that the kiss off that Leo uses, and that's basically like, I'm done with you. If I never see him again, that'll be too soon. But it's important to note that he doesn't want to kill him. Right. right. He doesn't he doesn't want him dead. He just wants him gone. Um, and that's obviously very important. But now he's a uh, a free agent. Right. Yep. But I think the next thing he does is goes back to Verna. Right. And this is when he tells her about his dream. Is that correct? And the dream happens. I believe this is now. Uh, I think it might be. Yeah. I, I think you're right, Chuck. I think this is it. I should also mention that um, around this time is when my edible really kicked in. And uh, <laughs> even though I've seen this movie several times, it's still been a few years. And this is where the movie gets really complicated is in the third act. Um, the third act is kind of like the last hour of this movie in a way. Yeah. It's um, weird, right? Yeah. And, uh, so I'm going to be of little help as far as like stringing scene to scene together, <laughs> but I know the broad and, and to be honest, <laughs> this is kind of where I start to, to struggle a little bit with the movie too. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Uh, and, and only because let, let me, okay. So we, we hit the, the important part, right? Like, you know, Tom has, made himself a free agent and really the final act is him starting to worm his way into casper's group and right. he begins to kind of manipulate things from the inside totally out. totally now, which is the meek doesn't trust him at all right casper the dane, casper, the dane the, doesn't the Dane, yeah, sorry. Yeah. The Dane doesn't trust him at all. We should mention that we have seen the Mink. We see the Mink once in this movie. And um I call him the Mink. He's just Mink. And it's he's played by um Steve Buscemi, who who Jeff said is doing his best Peter Lorre impersonation. I, I will go <laughs> so far as to say he is the uh Peter Lorre of the nineties. <laughs> yeah, I'll agree with that. Um and it's it's heavily implied in that scene with Mink and um, Tom, that Mink and Bernie are in cahoots. Yes. Yeah. So, um, and so, you know, Tom has this information and he, he knows that the Mink is the Dane's boy. And here's where we get into some really interesting, like um, not even undertones. I mean, it's, there is a sexual relationship happening between the Dane and Mink and probably the Mink and Bernie. It's a, it's a, it's this, um, uh, what do they call that? A, uh, Menage a trois? No, uh, but it's a, a tri- love, tri- love triangle. triangle. Right. Love triangle. And, um, and that, I love how deftly that is navigated without coming right out and saying it. I did not pick that up the first time I saw this movie when I was like 12, right? I didn't have any real concept of that. But, you know, it's, you know, it's definitely right there when you right. watch it as an adult who, who understands these things. And it's fascinating because the way that, that um, Gabriel Byrne, Tom, you know, presents this information to Casper, you know, I think he said something along the lines of Bernie and Mink are as cozy as mice and it ain't just business. And Dane doesn't like hearing that. The Dane doesn't like hearing that because that means that Mink is stepping out on him. And Casper is it just doesn't believe it. He's like, nah, I just don't read it that way, right? But he kind of does. He knows, and that it's and that's and that knowledge, uh, and that understanding of that relationship between Mink and the Dane is what ends up tipping Casper's uh, favor to Tom's story over the Danes. That was a mouthful. One hundred percent, though. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was quite a bit. Uh, but, but, but yeah, uh, well, and see, this is this is where this. Uh, well, I mean, you did better than I could have. Um, and and I think this is where my criticism comes in is that this movie start. It was already complicated and mm-hmm. and, and not negatively uh, convoluted, but but a good solid deep dense story um Mm -hmm. this whole part and all of the inner workings um it's it's a bit much 
And mm-hmm. I really didn't like the last scene where it was then explained to us. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's like, I understand why it's there. I understand that this is the, the end and, you know, and all of There it. is something about that last scene where something is explained to us that I 100 million percent love, though. Um, so, but we're not there yet. Right. But, but yeah, so, I mean, yeah, these is, this is just when I was kind of struggling just a little bit, um, with, yeah. the, with the movie as a whole. I love yeah. it. I love all of the, <laughs> the narrative threads in this movie. I get bored when there's not a lot to think about, unless that's what I'm signing up for. I, I, I forgot how overwhelming it is though. in that in the third act and to my detriment this time around. Um, right. but yes, I still quite love it but it, you do have to pay attention <laughs> yeah. you have to pay attention and it's one that i think you need to spend a fair amount of time thinking about after it's over um it I th- and i think it deserves that thought in my opinion but yeah kind like of. you guys are saying tom goes to casper he gives him well actually he sees verna first they have a conversation how they both double crossed leo but he manages to get the information of where bernie is yeah which is 302 some apartment in some building yeah yeah. Um, then he goes to see casper and to prove that he is in right i'm on your side now i'm a free agent i'm here for you i will tell you where bernie is yes which is what he's known should happen the entire time in this movie yeah but they Um, have no idea that that he was always has always been willing to give up Bernie, which is great. He's that's a card he's played close to his chest. If if he was as, as good an actual card player as he is a metaphorical card player, he would not have any gambling bet. Interesting, right? Um, that 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 he is poor at. It, it's almost like the Coens did this on purpose to make you think he's bad mm-hmm. at planning, right? That, yeah. To make you think he's bad at reading situations yeah. when he's in reality he's not. Um, right. He knows all the angles. But he gives up, yeah, he gives up where Bernie is and Casper's like, well, here's what you're going to do. You're going to go with Tic Tac and uh, whatever the other dude's name is. What is it called, Mike Starr? Yeah, Mike (laughs) Starr, and you're going to go pick up Bernie. Want to hear the most annoying sound in the world, Mike Starr? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah, that is the same dude. Yeah. Nice. Um, And take him to Miller's Crossing, which Miller's Crossing is – the famous place in every um, gangster movie where people yeah. go to die. Yeah. Um, this would be like the desert in Good Goodfellas, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I like it how it has the name crossing in it because it alludes to like, you know, life and death you're passing over. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Yep. But they, Tic Tac and Mike Starr, are like, well, the boss wants you to kill him. So you're going to take him out there. And Taturo is just brilliant. Like this entire, when he's in the car and when they get into the woods and he's walking out there and this is when they clearly call out the heart of, of Tom. And he keeps saying, look into your heart, look into your heart. I'm praying to you. I'm praying to you. Look into your heart. And um, one of the, the goons, I think it was Tic Tac, said, make sure you put one in, one in them to stop them and then another one in the brain, right? Yep. Which is important later um, for sure. So Tom decides not to kill him. And this is one moment in the movie where I think he didn't think he would have to get involved. Right. So he has to make a decision that's outside of his original plan in my opinion. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting choice because uh, it, it is a crossroads for him, right? You know, is he going to be the killer? Can he really do the things he say needs to be done? Right. And in that moment he, he doesn't, and it's read very much as a moment of, of moral victory for our main character, which is going to be thrown in our face later. 100%. Um, So yeah, he, he basically lets him go and he tells him you need to, you need to get out of town. He fires two shots to make it sound good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. He fires two shots, tells him he needs to get out of town, never be seen again, or it's going to be bad for everybody. Um, And then he walks back to Tic Tac and toe. Um, 
I, I wanted to talk real quickly about um, it's it's that yeah tac and toe. He is a toe, a toe yeah. head, Mark Star. <laughs> um, <laughs> I there there's something I noticed in this in the editing. And it's it really fascinating. It, so it's that it's that that sort of moment where you know Gabriel Byrne is pointing the gun down at John Turturro, and it's it's a two shot right over the shoulder kind of deal. You've got um, Turturro looking up at uh, Byrne, and then Byrne looking down at Turturro, and it's shot like that. Um, and then you you see Gabriel Byrne pointing the gun, and he fires. And it's that moment then in storytelling, did he kill him? Did he not? And to, to obviously tell, to answer that question, you've got to then put the shot, you know, down at Totoro to see what happened. And I think there's an interesting, like it, 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 the edit on this is perfect. It does not linger too long. It lingers just the right amount of time. And that's hard to define. But it's amazing because it, it, it happens faster than you would expect. I think a less accomplished storyteller would let that, that linger longer with the audience, but you don't need to. You, everything that needs to be conveyed is being conveyed here. Let's, let's answer the question, and they do. Um, so anyway, just something I noticed in the, the, the technical decision there. Yeah, I always forget, like, if this was a modern movie, um, then 100% would have left that scene on a on a fade to black and then a gunshot or two. Um, yeah, and it's not even it's not even the that they'd answer the question. It's that they the, the timing in which they answer the question. Right. Right. right? It's it, they they don't let it linger um, longer than it needs to. Yeah. Yep. So for everybody else's belief bernie is dead now um and i'm trying to remember what happens next i have a note where uh he was a good sport for bumping the schmott uh well tommy goes yeah tommy goes back to see casper and this is when casper hits his kid um yeah, yeah and it really does look like he scene. does hit that kid because the kid's got yeah. a red cheek uh yeah <laughs> and it's you yeah know, you're, it, you're uh, and Gabriel Byrne reacts to that in a way where either this gives him uh, more confirmation that he's doing the right thing or that he is that uh, that he himself is going to bring this guy down or it gives mm-hmm. him more confirmation that this guy is capable of anything. It's right. one or the other or both right. probably. Um, right. And, yeah. yeah, it's just a split yeah. second reaction, but he is shocked. I mean, and, and that's why maybe he really did hit that kid. And he's like, "Whoa, goddamn, Polito, what are you doing?" And this is, and this is when he starts to lay the seeds of doubt with Casper on the relationship between the Dane and Mink, because Mink has disappeared. So yeah. why is the Mink disappeared? You know what? You know, I hit him in. You know him in. Uh, um, the Dane, Eddie Dane, have been have been the ones that have really been leaking them leaking the information about your bets, right? Yeah. Uh, so he's laying that that, and he's also laying this, the 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 information he knows about their their sexual relationship without coming right out and saying. And that's when that's when Casper says, "I just don't read it that way." Um, so he, this is where he's really he he's like, "Okay, now I have his trust. Now I'm going to start to manipulate that trust to get yeah. what I need, right?" Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, it's um, important. But, but then the Dane in the next scene, it, he, of course, he doesn't trust Tom at all. He can't trust him as far as he can throw him. And then the next scene, he says, "You know, I uh, we're gonna go for a little ride." And what do they do? They're gonna go back Take out, out to uh, Miller's to Miller's Crossing. Miller's Crossing, and yep. uh, they're gonna look for the body. Uh, they pretty much uh, don't find anything at first. So, so the Dane's gonna kill Tom just on the spot and then all of a it's sudden it's a great scene it's a great scene because they're, they're the tension in this is great because you know he didn't kill bernie he knows he didn't kill bernie and it's like what the fuck's gonna happen here and and tom this is this is when tom gets lucky yes There's no two ways about it because tom yeah. knows he's fucked and he starts to vomit because right. he's he's succumbing to the pressure of of this moment he knows that uh, it's up for him he has no doubt in his mind Yep, and, and the Dane uh, sees that reaction, and he knows 
Yeah. Right. And so, but a couple of the other guys that are out there with them, what do they find? They find a body dressed in tic and toe. Yeah, they are, they found somebody that yes. is more or less dressed just like Bern, uh, Bernie was, uh, yep. and and the face has so like the face, <laughs> the face is, is gone. Shot off. Yeah, <laughs> he says, "I told you to put one in his brain, not his stinking face." <laughs> and he's laughing. He's through, laughing gagging. through it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's hanky time because they say when they find the body they're like it's hanky time <laughs> that's so great and, 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 and then but, but what's brilliant about that is is you could also then read tom vomiting as smelling the decomposing body right, right? so it lays it lays even more cover for him yeah 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 so then uh yeah so really what the, that's the meat actually uh the yeah, meat that's is, the, is the body um yep. but it pretty much for the most part gets tom off the hook for the moment um, yeah yeah i mean the dane can't rightly kill him now in front of tic tac and toe because they know there's a body there as well right right, right. so he has to stick to the 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 ethics and the honesty yep of of their casper's rules yep. yeah yeah 100 yep one thing we haven't mentioned that happens a little earlier since we want to talk about the hat later um, is Tom did visit Verna. They, you know, they did their deed and then he, he gets a call in the morning from somebody unimportant, but she wakes, she wakes up and says, are you still up? And then he tells her the dream about his hat. Oh yeah. Blowing off his head mm -hmm. and blowing off into the distance. And she says something like, well, did you chase it? And when you caught it, it was something else. Like she's alluding to love or something like that. Him capturing a prize. He's like, no, it was just a stupid hat. There's nothing I didn't more. Chase it. Yeah. And I didn't I... chase it. There's nothing more stupid than a man chasing his hat. Yeah. Important. Um, yes. But back to, Back to now, Casper again talks about ethics and honesty um, because they did find the body out there, etc. Yada yada, and Casper or Tom kind of says, "Hey, the mink's been behind all this. He's coming to my apartment at four o'clock um, to collect money or, or collect something. Um, you should be there too." And he's like, "No, yeah, we but should go get him now." And he's like, "No." And in another part of this. Unless you were going to discuss that. Go ahead, Jason. I was going to mention the raid that Casper orders. Oh, yeah, there is a raid. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just that, that mirror double image, right, of, okay, the, the shift of power has changed. Now Leo's are now Casper's ordering the same types of raids that Leo has, but on Leo and, and the chief is going through his same motion of, I don't understand all this, you know, why um, – uh, it's just a mess. It's a damn mess. And Tom is still there because Tom is always the guy, no matter what, that is above reproach, right? He's always um, got protection of some variety. Right. Um, he's never going to be in a situation that where he is the, you know, not with, with the power is the way he kind of feels, right? But anyway, the, the thing I want to mention the most about the scene is, um, is, is Sam fucking Raimi is in this scene. Yep. You guys notice that? Yep. Yeah, he, he's one of Casper's goons, and he's got a Tommy gun, and he shoots up the, the, the guy who comes running out of the warehouse, and then he gets shot the fuck up, too. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering if he was a goon or part of the police department. Oh, uh, either, he, way. It, either way, he's a goon. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that scene feels very much like a, how can we get Sam into this film? Because oh, it's completely yeah. unnecessary <laughs> yeah. scene in this movie. It doesn't add, it adds zero to the, the narrative, really, because there had been another raid at Leo's club um, when Tom was there, and he runs into the chief outside again, and that's a real mirror there. I'd also heard rumors that one of the 1920s cars used the chassis of the classic. No, I'm kidding. No, I love it. I love it. I'm kidding. <laughs> but yeah, we have that kind of mirrored image, exactly as you said. It's just showing the balance of power right. shifted. Right. Um, we also had a visit from Bernie with, with Tom where he kind of put his foot down on Tom and is like, yep. Hey, if you don't do what, what I tell you to do, 
and kill Casper. I think he wants Casper to be dead within one day. Then I'm going to start eating at restaurants. Yep. Basically, people are going to know you didn't kill me. Yep. Um, but later, either right before, I think it's right before Tom, or Tom tells Casper to come to his place at four, Bernie calls him again. And he's like, look, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Tells him like, you're screwed. Um, come to my place at 4 a.m. for something, right? I don't even know what he wants him to go there for. Um, but he basically arranges for Casper and Leo, or Bernie, excuse me, to be at his place at 4 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, but before that, um, Casper has to make... Oh, yeah. yeah. Before before he sends Casper to to before Tom says, sends Casper to Tom's apartment, there's the scene where, where Tom really, really makes his final pitch to Casper that it's the Dane that you need to be concerned about. And, um, and Casper at this point has, has hit that breaking point that we've talked about. He's not sure, you know, what's up from down, you know, he, he doesn't know who to trust his, his, his ethical, um, structure is crumbling around him he even he even can't he can't even make the decision to kill the dane even though he sees it's right potentially because he says he says you double cross once where does it all end right he's like he, it goes so against his nature to be the double crosser um but and, and but ultimately and that he, becomes a uh, that becomes an ethical question too right because once you make an exception to your rules there is no yeah. logical reason not to ever do it again or not to be asked yeah. to do it again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. Yeah. So that plays to ethics uh, more than morals because morals, you can kind of most certainly, you know, just kind of navigate that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. All great stuff. Um, but he, but then the Dane sees the opening is like the Dane is going to kill Tom to, to basically end this charade. Um, which is the right move by the Dane. And, but Tom has done enough, just enough to crack um, uh, Casper. Casper steps in and kills the Dane. And it's the famous, you know, oh man, John Polito is, is magnificent in this scene. He's magnificent in that scene too, where, where, where Tom has pushed him just far to his breaking point of what he can tolerate as lip. And he's shaking visibly and the sweat is pouring down his brow, right? Oh, John Polito is, is truly just phenomenal in this movie, but he, this is the kind of the camera gets real busy in this scene. It's doing a lot of like, like steady cam zooms and uh, and uh, it feels very much like it was shot by Raimi actually, and um, and it comes up from the ground right into Polito's face after he shoots the Dane in the head and he, he gives him that the famous line he always always shoot one in he always put one in the in the brain. Well, you yeah. also have but you yep. also have oh. Drop Johnson screaming. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a whole kind of subplot. I don't quite understand. I don't understand that, that uses, subplot either. It's something about like he finds out who is going to throw who who the fix like who's the fix on through that guy because he laid a big bet because he somehow found out. And then this the is day, how he knows that Bernie is is showing up in town. Yeah, 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 yeah. And not and not. Um, because because dude. Drop Johnson yeah. bought the tip, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and when he, he knows he bought the tip Bernie. because he made a big bet for Bernie, yeah, exactly. Yes. yes. Um, and the Dane finds that out too, and he's is using that as proof that um, that Bernie's still alive, right? Yeah. But but a way to go, and this whole scene shot like a horror film too, with Polito in his chair with the fireplace beneath him the shot shooting down at him and yep. you know, sweating it's like and he's menacing so menacing in this scene but anyway long and short of it the dane gets the short end of of the bullet and um and tom tells uh casper where to find mink but he actually tells him where to find bernie right and yep. uh yeah so he sorry i skipped a lot of that important stuff all good babe yeah so it. he then goes to the uh barton arms 
and uh, <laughs> there's a gunshot, and there's uh, there's been uh, he finds a hat on the stairs, and uh, this old lady, it's like, oh, there's been a gunshot, and he's like, oh, just go and and call the cops, ma'am. Uh, Will my cats be okay? Oh, I'm sure they'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then that might be the <laughs> most solid impression you've ever done, Jeff. That was <laughs> magnificent. It's almost as good as Jason humming the Monday Night Football. Oh <laughs> man, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, Sorry. He's just, he's just <laughs> making yummy me. sounds. Um, anyway, so uh, so yeah, so he goes upstairs. It's uh, it, it is Casper. He's dead. He's been shot by uh, uh, by Bernie. And uh, so, like you know, Tom's like, okay, give me give me the gun, and we're gonna we're gonna figure how how to basically solve for all of this. We're gonna. We're going to do all this. And, and while he's doing it, he's kind of cleaning out burn or he's cleaning out uh, Casper's pockets, uh, which also has a gun in it. Um, and you pretty much know exactly where this is going because uh, he's got both guns now. Um, and yeah. he turns on uh, Bernie and uh, basically – uh, Bernie tries to uh, cry and plead his case and squirt a few tears out again. And he's like, look into your heart, look into your heart. And he shoots him and he's like, what heart? Well, at some point he says, what heart? Yeah. 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 Um, so the whole idea so, here was that he convinced Bernie to give him the gun because they were going to pin it on Mink. Yeah. And then he tells him, or the Dane. And then he tells him, oh, we can't do that. Yeah, the Dane, Dane was killed the, a couple hours ago. So uh, yeah, he's dead. Yeah. He says something like he's dead, uh, like, um, yeah, across town or something. He's already dead. Um, yeah, yeah. So, but basically, he sets it up so it looks like Bernie and Casper shoot each other. Right, right. That they killed each other in this hallway, and that's that's it. Um, which, for the most part, it is. Yep. It. But yeah, he and next then, ends up going. Yeah, go so then then he goes to um, Bernie's funeral, essentially, and uh, and uh, uh, um, Verna and um, Leo are there, and he says, um, uh, you know, he says, you know, uh, he, you know, they kind of get back together. Leo says, hey. Um, Verna and I are getting married, and he's like, "Oh, congratulations!" And he's like, "Yeah, you don't really probably mean that." And he's like, "Ah, eh, whatever." And he's like, "Let me <laughs> let me explain to you my whole plan, and what happened." <laughs> um, and then, uh, oh, Verna takes off on him. <laughs> that was a well, good well, well, well. Hold on, hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on, hold on. Sorry, I had to get up for something real quick. But um, there's a really great thing in this in the confrontation between bernie and um tom and i'm sorry if i missed it or if you mentioned it but um tom asks bernie why did mink kill rug and this is like the most important thing that happens in the movie to, to move the plot on is mink killing rug or, or someone killing rug and it was mink and he asked well why did mink kill rug and he's like oh, i don't know it was just one of those things it was a mix-up that's it. I love yeah. it. Like, <laughs> there's no yeah. reason. It was a mix-up. And that, that is very much like the she kidnapped herself in The Big Lebowski, right? Yeah. It is, it's, the, it's that thing that happens that for no good reason that causes chaos. And right. it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So he, also says, he also says when he shows up at the funeral, he says, great turnout, Tom does. Wow. Right. Yeah. Talk about like twist in the fucking knife man <laughs> right and uh yeah because she she kind of blows past tom gets in the car drives off to which uh tom i think says well she just she just took our ride and and leo's like i guess, oh, we're, I guess walking. we're walking <laughs> yeah i guess we're walking yeah, um, yeah. and then there's uh, a great there's a great moment um to i want to i don't want to Sorry, go ahead, finish. I was, <laughs> I was just going to say, at this point, uh, Tom basically says, nah, I'm not coming back to the business. I'm done. 
and yeah. as as is the movie the movie's like all right we're done yeah. well there's but it's important a- too because he pulls his hat down yeah. very important to his character he pulls it down once and then he pulls it way down um and he could tell he's he's a little bit about to cry maybe actually cry um because the last person he really cares about is walking away and that's yeah. it he's done yeah. with them yeah. um but go ahead jason no no saying. that's good that, that that it's um it is it's a sad ending right yeah because Tom is, he kind of got what he always wanted in the fact that he is his own man responsible for his own actions, not, not, um, beholding to anyone, but, uh, but it's also to his greatest detriment that he lost his best friend over this whole affair, even though, but it was also like this self-sacrificial thing that he did. You know, he made a lot of, a lot of, decisions that probably went against his personal morals to to make sure that leo came out of this whole thing alive and back on top um so he is the very much that anti-hero in the sense that he he um he did what he accomplished for someone else he didn't really get anything out of it in the end in fact he became a lesser man in a lot of ways because of it because he he had to take a life um the uh and he didn't really even have to do it that's the thing because like he said you know and everybody who cared that bernie was alive is dead right yeah um the one thing i wanted to mention was his altercation with lazar's uh leg breakers i really really like this scene and i want to i wish that lazar there's a movie about lazar and tom because there's a moment that happens where, um, you know, he takes his beating and they tell him, Lazar said not to break anything this time. And he was like, you know, he, but if they did, he would have been totally fine with it. Cause that's, that's the rules that he understands he's playing in that game. Right. So you're going to get your leg broken if you don't pay your gambling debts. I and mean, he won't squawk. If, he won't and squawk. He, won't, and he won't squawk. Yep. Yep. And then he, after they beat him up, you know, he tells, um, the guys he's like just tell lazar there's no hard feelings and the one guy says well christ tom he knows that Ugh. like i love it i love it i mean again it goes to that ethics that loyalty that understanding of how the game is played um it's just a it's one of my favorite moments in the movie it, it speaks to it speaks to the whole the whole kind of uh integrity of the um the organization of the, of the underground of the underground crime. that 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 we're seeing yeah exactly yeah. anyway um yeah. yeah i agree with that um so what uh what are your thoughts on the hat the hat um wow i mean it, it's a lot right um i think at its basis level it signifies like a dignity um, the hat is is symbolic of of Tom and others sort of connection to again I think their personal ethics their personal morals and and not allowing that part of themselves to um, to be compromised or clinging to some sense of that right it is it's what it's like what's separating them bet- from animals is this formal is it this formal um appearance this this digni- this dignity right this um this uh this rule of law within yeah. their own breaking of the law and when they lose the hat or when tom loses the hat you know it's it's he's trying to get it back he's trying to kind of keep centered it's it's what centers him symbolically i think it also i agree with that and i think it also is some kind of protection for Tom and it probably is intertwined with that dignified or human human being human is to be able to wear a hat. But mm-hmm. every time he's not wearing it, something bad happens to him mm-hmm. at the very end of the movie. When, when, when Leo's walking away from him, he pulls it down, pulls it on tighter than he ever has because mm-hmm. it's, it's all he can rely on now. Yeah. Is his yeah. Hat. You know, yeah. he has nothing else. Um, yeah. So it's an interesting kind of narrative just in this piece of cloth that he wears on his head. 
the whole time. Yeah, and it, it speaks uh, uh, to you know Rug's rug as well, right? It's yeah, this this appearance of of dignity, right, in an undignified profession. Right. Um, Agree. And also, Drop Johnson's gotten too big for his hat. <laughs> Yeah, yes. <laughs> he was thinking too much. He was thinking too much. <laughs> yep. So I assume that's Bernie's hat. I oh, that's, uh, yeah. That's, Bernie lives. It, it probably is. Yeah. Yeah. What about yeah. the use of words in this movie? Like m- words, maybe I shouldn't. I don't know if I should like re say them, but Sheeny and Skell and Schmop and Twist and Rumpus and Daffy, like all <laughs> of these words that they use that are just like Daffy is you only, kind of. Uh, and this is Daffy is only racist towards ducks. So we're okay. Fair. <laughs> I have. I, 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 I know without a without a shadow of the doubt that I have not seen nearly the amount of film noir that Joel and Ethan Cohen have. But it feels to me like very much a, a, a melting pot of all of that, all, all those like 1930s, 1940s um, film noir that yeah, they're like drawing she, from. Sheeny is a bad term for a Jew. I know that. Um, Skell is like a small time criminal. A schmott, which they say a lot, is just a shabby piece of, piece of clothing. <laughs> um, I think twist, yeah, schmada. I think twist means girl. Um, yeah. Twist is kind uh, of like a yeah, uh, probably a game. An, uh, yeah. probably an easy girl too at that. Yeah, maybe yeah. I mean that they only ever describe one girl in this movie, right? That's they true. only ever yeah. describe um, uh, Verna. Um, but yeah, what's the rumpus, man? I surprised the name of this movie isn't "What's the Rumpus" for how many <laughs> times they say it. But it just—I mean, I'm guessing just means. I like I like when um, I like when the guy wakes up Tom. He's like, "You're wake up, Tom." He's like, "I'm awake." He's like, "Your eyes are closed." He's like, "Who are you gonna believe?" <laughs> yeah, who are you gonna believe? <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Um, well, have we done it? Uh, we done did it. I think so. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna start yeah. talking about the other stuff. Or are we gonna start talking about other stuff? Yeah, the Whatever. next 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 yeah. week we uh, we move on. Next? We move on from Miller's Crossing over into the small world of Barton Fink. Indeed, I think that discussion is gonna be a lot of fun. Oh, one quick question. Um, I, I came to this realization really late while watching Miller's Crossing, but is Tom? Gabriel Byrne in every scene? No, he's not. He's never not. He's not. I just answered my own question. He's not. He's in a lot of the scenes, but he's not in all. Of them. He's in most. Yes. The one that made me remember that he's not is the the scene in the alley with Rug. He's definitely oh, yeah. not scene. Nope. Yeah. You're right. He's so you got but you got a slack jawed kid and his dog. Yep. 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 Um. Yeah, so uh yeah, so, yes. Martin next Fink. week's Barton Fink. Uh we go from a very large movie with a lot of moving mm-hmm. pieces to an extremely small movie with only a few moving pieces and I do think Barton Fink is in every scene of that movie. Mm-hmm. And arguably um a movie that is smaller but has more layers certainly uh potentially depending on how you approach the movie which i'm sure we all have different ideas <laughs> that. um so yeah uh that is next wednesday that's going to be at uh, filmseizure.com that is the conclusion for now of cohen brothers month um we will probably be getting back uh to them uh probably sometime in 2022 i would imagine feel like that could be a that could be an annual thing uh for a little bit sounds pretty good yeah Yeah. not too bad not too bad um yeah so uh filmseizure.com that's where you can find that stuff you can also find uh my show monster mondays there this upcoming monday is uh finally godzilla versus kong 2021 um you can um hear the explanation as to why it's so much later uh, than when the movie came out because that movie was on a real sliding timeline in real life for a long time. <laughs> and so uh, I finally just said, screw it. I'm not moving anything around anymore. Um, yeah. And then, uh, yeah. So both of those things at 
uh, filmseizure.com. You can uh, find the podcast in places like uh, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, uh, Audible, uh, yeah, Audible, and um, also on YouTube. So you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. No video um, because we have uh, faces for radio, not for video. <laughs> we are doing you all a favor. Let us know. Let us Speak know if you want to see our faces. Maybe we can organize some kind of facial facey face. Facial time. facey? Oof. Facial facey FaceTime. You know, like a Twitch like, or something like, like, like that. A, like a hockey movie? If people want to see us, I'll lose some weight and get on the camera. <laughs> Potentially. Potentially we could do that. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so you can do those things. If you like what we do, we do have a coffee account, so you can go to ko-fi.com slash film seizure. Buy us a coffee. Um, we don't drink coffee. We mostly drink booze while we uh, talk. But that's uh, but, but a coffee is probably help, uh, you know, dry us out, too. So um, I drink a coffee a day, so buy me a damn coffee. There you go. <laughs> I drink tea, so buy me an Earl Grey hot. That would be fantastic. Um, in the meantime, you can also go over to my website, bmovieanima.com. This upcoming, uh, this upcoming Friday, I have Truck Stop Women. That's a fun one. That's a Claudia Jennings movie. So it's a good little uh, heisty movie. So it's a little bit of crime, and there's a, there is a mob element. So I think we perfectly uh, planned that uh, as it turned out. So you can do that. You can also follow... Uh, uh, B movie enema on YouTube. Subscribe to that channel. Season number two coming soon of B movie enema the series. So looking forward to that. Having good times uh, all the times, doing the good times. Um, yeah. So <laughs> <laughs> so join us next week for Barton Fink. Uh, I don't really have anything left to say. I think I covered everything. Yeah. So cool. Cool. For myself, I am Jeff Arbuckle. For myself, I'm Chuck Moore. I've given him the high hat. I'm Jason Oliver, and you have been listening to Film Seizure.